Again, thank you for joining us today for this session of the AgriAbility webinar series. My name is Paul Jones. I'm the manager of the National AgriAbility Project, which is headquartered here at Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. Our topic today is on UAVs, or commonly known as drones, their application in agriculture, and that also includes their application for people with disabilities in agriculture. And our presenter today is Mark Carter. He is uh, the, the Purdue Extension Agriculture and Natural Resources Educator from Delaware County in Indiana and also the Precision Ag Educator. Some of you may not be familiar with AgriAbility. AgriAbility is sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and our focus is on uh, issues of disability in agriculture. Every AgriAbility project is a partnership between a land-grant university and at least one nonprofit disability services organization. Right now, there are 20 funded state projects around the country. Again, the National AgriAbility Project is led by Purdue University's Breaking New Ground Resource Center. And our current partners on the National AgriAbility Grant include Goodwill of the Finger Lakes, April, which is the Association of Programs for Rural Independent Living, Colorado State University, and Washington State University. If you want more information about AgriAbility, feel free to check out the AgriAbility website, agriability.org. We have more than 70 archived webinars on that site and a wealth of other information, including contact information for the state projects. So you can check to see if your state has an AgriAbility project. Okay, at this point, I'm going to pass the presentation ball to Mark Carter, and he will give the, uh, the body of our presentation, and then I will return for the polls and the question and answer period at the end. Okay, thank you, Paul. Appreciate everybody letting me be here today uh, and bringing uh, UAV use and agriculture to you. Um, please bear with me a little bit. My laptop with my uh, with my camera is over here, and my uh, my uh, screen that I'm looking at is just sitting right next to it. So if I'm looking to the left uh, or the right, whichever way it may be, uh, it's because I'm looking at my computer screen and not necessarily straight at my uh, camera. So again, my name is Mark Carter, Purdue Extension here in Delaware County. I'm the Ag and Natural Resources Educator. I'm also the statewide, they call it the Precision Ag Educator, but really it's the, the UAV uh, Initiative Coordinator for uh, about 82 or 83 of the 92 counties here in Indiana. Uh, we've got, as it, as it goes, we, we have uh, this is last year's numbers. We used to have 17 edu extension educators that were flying drones out in the counties, working with local producers, working with local government, working with uh, uh, people, landowners that had forestry or livestock, um, working with golf courses. We've we've uh, we've worked with a wide client uh, base of clients that. Uh, we we and we've really had great success with with uh, teaching people about how we can use the uh, UAV technology in agriculture. Um, and I will apologize also. I'm downtown Muncie and uh, we're in the county building, so we you may hear some sirens from time to time. So please bear with us. Um, we have several specialists that are using the UAVs. Uh, our corn specialist, soybean specialist, um, two coordinators, which I'm one. We've got a digital ag coordinator over on campus. Uh, his name is John Scott. He he works within uh, Tippecanoe County and all the surrounding counties as part of the, the Wabash, uh, Heartland, uh, I don't remember what all the, what the acronym is exactly, but they, they're trying to bring new technologies to producers and tie that marketplace with uh, ag retail and the producers. So they're trying to kind of bring the whole the, the whole system together uh, with new technology, uh, new opportunities for producers. 
and uh, new education. So we're really, ex I know they're really excited about that program. And then we also, we also have uh, several uh, Purdue Ag Centers that are um, using the UAVs as well. We've got uh, the Davis Purdue uh, Ag Center just over here in Randolph County. I spend quite a bit of time over there uh, flying and trying to learn the different part, or learning how different sensors can be utilized with different crops. And you know, we're we're really just scratching the surface on what a lot of this technology is doing, but with great success. So how are we how are we using UAVs in agriculture? Um, Field scouting is the big one. Crop scouting, we're you know getting that bird's eye view to be able to see what's out in the field. You know, just the coloration differences between maybe say a wet a uh, wet area in the field or a, a hillside or and and how the the factors of that that growing season are uh, affecting the crop, whether it's through pests, uh, insect pressure, uh, disease. Um, uh, moisture, you know, the, all, all those kind of different things that, that separate or that differentiate the coloration of the vegetation. And when we take those pictures from above, you know, you can see that and it doesn't necessarily tell you what the problems are, but it tells you where you need to go scout. And that's the, that's the real benefit. Imagine if you will, you have an 80 acre cornfield. Now, if you've ever been out in a cornfield and you've tried to walk, you know, even 50 yards up and down the rows when that corn is 9 or 10 feet tall, one, you're going to get cut to ribbons, and two, you're, going to, you're not going to be able to see everything. Whereas that eye in the sky, you can actually start to look and you can see where if you walked up and down every row of that cornfield, you're liable to miss, you're, you're probably going to miss something. But most likely from the air, you're going to see those areas of color differentiation and you'll know exactly where you need to go scout. So other things we can do with aerial mapping, whether it's through surveying or uh, using them on the farms to create that whole map. Um, you, you can create some nice aerial maps. We'll take a look at some of those here in just a few minutes. Plant stand counts, very helpful in the springtime. Uh, it's, the technology is still kind of in its infancy, and it's not as proven as what some people would like to say it is. Uh, I, I think it's got another year or two before it's really going to be on par with, what, uh, w w with where it should be. That plant health, uh, we were t I was talking about with the field scouting, plant height. That's you know seeing what what uh, what growing uh, what growth stage the plants in. Most times you can if you it, not necessarily from straight above, but if you, if if you get a, a a side kind of a side view of it, you can see the plant height. Uh, you can find presence of weeds and disease, soil moisture and erosion. Erosion's a big one, especially when the crops are off. Some people really don't see the value in flying fields or being out and looking around at your fields when the crop is off, but there's still a lot of information there that you can find. You can find that, you, you can find tile. You can find areas uh, of erosion or a wash in a field. You can find where uh, maybe a a grass waterway is washing out, or a wasp cob. So there, there's different there's different things there you can do when the when, when your uh, when the crop's even off. Livestock management. Who would have ever thought you could sit on your front porch and get your drone out and fly out to the pasture and check and see if all your animals are there? You can check your forage. You can check to see if if there's enough water in the trough or if the water if you've got an automatic waterer to see if it's working, uh, you can go out and you can check fence. You can see if there's any trees down uh, over your fence. So there, there's a lot of different uses there in livestock. And then, of course, agribusiness marketing. Um, if, you, if you take a picture of your farm and you want to put it on your website, you want to put it on Twitter, you want to put it on Facebook, 
um, the, you know, so there's a lot of uses there too. Now, the pros to them, obviously, imagery is going to be done more frequently. It's done on your schedule. Uh, um, you're not going to go out and fly when it's raining or real, real cloudy. I mean, you can do it either when it's full cloud or uh, nice and clear. But if you're using a, 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 a flight planning software where you're going to stitch imagery together, if you have intermittent clouds, it can screw up your uh, it, it can screw up your pictures. And satellite works the same way too. On a partly cloudy day or a really cloudy day, satellites tend to have issues uh, just like the drone will. But the imagery is more precise. So if you look at the two pictures there uh, on the slide, you can see that the satellite image might give you, uh, I think the resolution last time I checked was about 30 feet, whereas the, the AgriJone MVVI is a uh, sub inch. So it's down less than one pixel is less than one inch. So the, the imagery is a lot more crisp and and you can see in greater detail what's going on. Now, does that say that the satellite is useless? Absolutely not. Really, the two work well together. The, I mean, there's enough information on that satellite that you know that exactly where you need to go and uh, do your scouting. So, um, but the imagery, it used to be cheaper than the satellite or plane, but that's kind of, pricing's really kind of all over the place right now. And the, but the biggest thing is, the, the biggest pro, you have all the control over your data. So you don't have to upload your imagery to a third, to a, a third party uh, software company. You can keep it all in-house and you can just make decisions off of the pictures that you take. But if you want to, if you want to use somebody like a drone deploy or Centera or Pix4D or whoever, you have that option. Now, the downside. Drones take time, more time and effort, time to fly the fields, charge batteries, process images and analyze data. You are not required to keep flight logs. That's one, one thing I need to stress is you are not required to do that. I work for Purdue. Purdue says that I am required to keep flight logs. However, if you're flying a, a DJI, most of them are the DJI requires on a manual flight that, that you fly off of their DJI Go 4 app. I, uh, there, there might be some other flight planning softwares or free flight, free flight planning softwares out there. I'm not using them. I use the DJI Go app when I fly. It works. It keeps records of where you're flying. Uh, it geo-references all pictures taken. So it does quite a bit of good. And then the, the, the drone's going to require more, more maintenance. I mean, you got to take care of your batteries. You got to take care of the bird. You got to there's a little more work to it. And then there's always that possibility that you can crash your investment, just like the smoking, smoldering pile of drone that you see right there in the picture. Let's see here. Okay. So let's take a little closer look at, uh, at uh, satellite versus drone. Real quick here, this is, this is my farm. Uh, I live up just north of Matthews, Indiana, if you all know where that's at. Uh, the picture on the left is climate, uh, climate field view. The picture on the right is drone, uh, drone deploy, and I flew it with my, with my DJI Phantom 4. So looking at them, the big takeaway here is they're, they're, most of it's pretty close, but if you look out there at the point, uh, you're going to see a lot of red surrounded by some yellow on the satellite view. But the drone uh, shows that uh, there's a lot more green there and a darker green, which indicates a healthier, uh, a healthier photosynthetic process and gives you, or is saying that the, the plant health is better than what the, the satellite says. So if you look at the uh, if you look at the harvest data, you can see that there was still there. There's still some 
some lower populations out there for yield, but off of that acre field, we have never taken more than 179 bushels off of that field. In fact, we took 200, I, I think I saw 263 bushels off of that one, no, 234, that's what it was, 234 bushels off of that point acre. And it worked out really nice. Now, some of it was, some of it was uh, hybrid, some of it was doing some different things with uh, fertilizer. But if you go back to the other image and look at that, uh, the, the satellite got it wrong and the drone got it right. Now, I'm not saying that the satellite is always wrong. For some people, the satellite works really well. And if that's the case, hey, great, use it. I mean, if that meets your needs. If it doesn't, then the drone is another option. But they do work together really well. Okay, so... If you've decided, hey, drone sounds good, what do we got to do to fly it? Well, the FAA or the Federal Aviation Administration in all of their uh, mountain of uh, rules and regulations says if you are going to use a drone for anything that brings value to your organization or business, you need a license. Now, you don't have to go get your commercial pilot's license. But you do have to get the the remote uh, the remote pilot certification, um, which is good for small UA, UAS classifications. Now UAS uh, small unmanned aircraft systems. That means your drone, your radio, your iPad, your phone, whatever you're using to fly that drone is considered a small unmanned aircraft system. If you call it a UAV, that just means unmanned air, aerial vehicle. That's referring to the drone itself. Um, for our uh, for our purposes, we'll just call them a drone. That's what everybody uh, kind of understands it as. But with that, they're Part 107, uh, what they call the Part 107 to the Title 14 code says that you have that one you have to have. Your, uh, your UAS uh, certification, which it's not real hard to get. Uh, mo the, the hardest part is you take a 60-question test. You got two hours to take it. It's multiple choice, and you have to get better than, uh, I think it's a 70% or better to, to, to pass the test. And if you study, it's not real hard. If you don't study, you're probably going to bomb it. Um, but they also the the major provisions that they have for this is your the this and this applies to it is any drone that's between a half a pound and 55 pounds you got to keep the thing in line of sight which means if you're standing alongside of the road and you're you got a cornfield you're flying a cornfield you have to be able to see to the back of the field and still see that drone now on a half mile field, that's not easy with a white drone in the in the clear sky. So there's there's different things you can do there. Um, you cannot operate over people. So if you have a drone already and you're flying over the top of the parade or you're flying over the top of the football field uh, while people are out there playing, you're not allowed to do that. And that's not just for people with the license. That's everybody. We are restricted, with those of us with the commercial license are restricted to daylight operations only. We re everybody has to yield the right of way to other aircraft. Everybody has priority over you in the sky, which means even if you come across a blimp or a balloon or an ultralight, everything including ducks and geese have, uh, ha have the right of way over us. So, uh, you got, that's one of the reasons you have to keep a uh, visual line of sight so you can see what is around that bird. And when you're out flying and a, and a crop duster crosses into your field and they're actually below what your drone's flying at, uh, you still have to be able to give them the right of way to get through there safely because they can't stop and drop quite as easy as what we can. Now, the maximum flight altitude that we have is 400 feet above the ground. 
that uh, <coughs> excuse me that is from the uh, from wherever that drone's at is 400 feet. So if you take off and you're on top of the hill, when you're at the bottom of that hill, you're 400 feet above there, which may only be 250 feet above you. So that kind of follows the terrain. But that 400 feet is really important when you start thinking that all other aircraft are supposed to stay above 500 feet. And uh, then you get, op you get people flying drones that go up, you know, several thousand feet. I, I bought a, or I was trying to buy a Mavic off of uh, Craigslist one time, and he posted the maximum altitude that he'd been at 13,500 feet. Now, just imagine what that drone would do to a 737 if it got sucked into one of the engines. It's probably not going to end real pretty for the 200 plus people that could be killed from that experience. So that's why they have the 400 feet altitude limit. And then there's a few others there you can, that you can kind of look through. And I know I'm getting kind of long-winded on some of this stuff. To get your remote pilot certification, you got to be at least 16, speak English. You have to pass a background check, take the written multiple choice aeronautical knowledge exam, um, and then you, you, you retake that test every two years. Um, you don't have to have any experience and you don't need the medical card, which is a real benefit uh, for those that uh, haven't been flying. So. As we move, uh, as, we, as you think about what it takes to fly, they don't put all these rules in place to be a killjoy. They put the rules in place to keep people safe. And let me tell you, I, I never thought about it until I started flying the, the, the drones for Purdue that the sky is a very, very busy place. Uh, go out some time and just sit and listen for two, you know, five or ten minutes and you're liable to hear an airplane fly over, you're liable to hear a jet fly over, and you never know when the uh, National Guard's gonna be flying the F-16s or the A-10s. So uh, just something to keep in mind when you, if you're gonna operate one of these. Let's go. Okay, so now there's two different kinds of drones that are out there primarily that are used in agriculture. Uh, the multi-rotors, quadcopters, what we oftentimes call them. Um, most of the, you can kind of see the pricing and the what goes along with most of these. Uh, I know that the Mavic 2 is out now. It's kind of, it's replacing the Mavic Pro and the Phantom 4. Uh, the Matrice, nobody, not too many people still use the Matrice 100. The Matrice 200, 210, and 210 RTK are becoming more of the standard platform if you're using larger sensors. Um, but a lot of people really flock to the Phantom 4 Pro, Phantom 4 and Phantom 4 Pro. Um, I've been using one for two years and it's an absolute workhorse. I've probably flown uh, four or 5,000 acres with mine and it's given me zero trouble. So you can kind of see the price points that where you're gonna get in for some of those. And again, that's always changing. Even as soon as I update this, this list, everything will change again. So uh, this is really kind of where we make our money. When you start using the drones, you start thinking about what sensing options you're going to use. Um, the blue, green, and red, think of those as kind of, that, that's your visible light. That is what we see, that's the same that, that's what every camera uses, the blue, green, and red light spectrum. That's what's in your cell phone, it's what's in your iPad, digital camera, uh, even the camera here in my, in, in my uh, laptop is an RGB camera, or what we refer to as an RGB camera. And that gives you that nice, uh, what we call an ortho mosaic. It's a, basically if you're looking down, it's like looking at Google Earth and it gives you that real live picture of what you have there. So you can see in nice bright colors what you have. Now the other popular ones that, that most people are going to use are going to be NDVI and NDRE. Now NDVI, uh, normalized, uh, uh, normalized 
uh, differentiated vegetation index. That's going to use, if you look over here to the left, it's going to use the blue, green, red, and near infrared, that NIR. And that's going to take a special sensor. Uh, those sensors can range anywhere from $1,500 up to $20,000. And then you got to have a different bird to put them on. And then the final one is uh, normalized difference red edge, that NDRE. And that uses red edge. Now, if you think about um, if you have visible light here and uh, near infrared over here, that area right there in the middle, that font, that line right between the two of them, that's where you get your red edge. It's just barely on the, uh, it's right there on the verge of visible light, but go, but veering into that near infrared spectrum. And then that near infrared can also include things like uh, thermal, and that's something we don't I, that I haven't done too much work with, but we're starting to get more into that. You know, if you're looking for temperature variation within vegetation or soil, which can tell you some different things about moisture content. Orthomosaic, again, that's that two-dimensional image. Um, standard RB, RGB camera, it's like looking at Google Maps. It gives you that eye in the sky look. You can still, you can look at this image and you can see that there's something going on right through the middle of the field, kind of from left to right, you know, going from the middle of the field down to the to the right bottom corner, and you can see that there's some some different things going on there. As you look at that, or as we start to think about NDVI, that is just again that's just the difference in your vegetation, uh, and they they've all got stand they've got a standard between uh, one and zero. That's how they rank that. But as you look at your, uh, if you look at the the diagram, the near infrared uh, gets divided by uh, or gets subtracted by from the red the the red spectrum, uh, which is then divided by the near infrared value plus the red spectrum. So for this image, we're going to take uh, the the 0.5 minus 0.8 divided by 0 0.5 or 0 0.5 plus 0 0.08 and gives us a, an indication of 0 0.72, which is going to say we got a little bit more photosynthetic activity than the other side, which has only got 0.14 being on the lower end of that spectrum. So with that in mind, we can also introduce different algorithms based on whoever software we're actually using. In this instance, the, the two pictures on the left were created with a, a program called Drone Deploy. The two images on the right were created with a, with a program called BotLink. Now, the ones on the left, is, they are using just a standard RGB camera, which does not give you a true NDVI. Their algorithm is called Vary, and we'll look at that here in just a couple minutes. Um, it still gives you enough information, both in the orthomosaic and in the uh, in the plant health map, where you can see that there are some areas that you might want to go look at, especially if you don't have any history with the field. Now, if you have history with the field, you're going to say, "Yeah, I kind of expect that." No, I, I really wasn't expecting the other. But same thing, the, the picture on the top right is a, a true near-infrared picture. Normally, the darker the red, um, the healthier the plant. The lighter the red, uh, not quite as healthy. So you can see in the lower right image that there's a little more red in some of those uh, places. Uh, that, I think both of those are hillsides, actually. So you can kind of see what, what, what you got there. And again, the near infrared is going to reflect higher on a healthy leaf, which you can see on the right, as opposed to a dead leaf where nothing really reflects well. And that's the whole thing about using these different cameras. Again, I said earlier in the presentation that the coloration on the plants on the, uh, is going to be a little bit different, but this is what tell this is what tells the story of the field is we're looking at that reflectance 
through different uh, cameras. Again, we'll go back and look at uh, a, a, or the different ortho mosaics. We've got one from satellite. We've got one from a, a near infrared picture, and then just one from a drone. And as you look at that, you can start to tell some differences here. Um, you can kind of see where the tile lines are. The tile lines really pop on the on the uh, near infrared. That's where. Uh, that's what most of that is right there. But the one thing that the near infrared and the satellite doesn't show you, if you look at the UAV ortho mosaic, up there in the top corner, top left corner, you can see a, a, a light green patch. Now this is this is all nine foot corn right here. And what you don't see is that light green patch was actually 10 foot ragweed that the producer had in this field. And then the lines, the, the, the horizontal lines back and forth, he had a, he ended up having a, a, a knife on his uh, 28 applicator that was plugged. He ended up having 400 acres like that. So he, uh, he kind of pays attention to, to the imagery that he has now. Again, we can look at the, the different uh, NDVIs or ver, uh, or, plant health maps, and you can start to really see some differences. Now on the satellite, again, you can really see where the, where the tile is at and where it had good drainage. Um, and you can start to see a little bit on the true NDVI with the airplane. And it's a little fuzzier on the UAV plant health map. So to kind of cap all this, the, the NDVI is that normalized difference vegetation index. And we, you could see, uh, again, where the, the satellite and airplanes really uh, utilize the pictures from that near-infrared uh, light spectrum, other than the, the weedy areas, which were really seen better from the UAV. And then that, that UAV plant health map was using what they called very visible atmospherically resistant index. Again, it's a green, yellow, red map. Now, here's the dirty little secret that not all red is bad. So you look at this and you see red, green, yellow. Okay. In this case, yeah, the red areas were marginal areas that really needed to, to be looked at. But each, the, 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 the airplane and the, and the, the drone kind of match up a little bit better than what the satellite's telling. But if you think about, if you have two different hybrids and you split your planter, you're actually going to get two different colorations off of the two different varieties. So again, red is not always bad. It just means it's different. So that's where, that, that's where a good ortho mosaic is handy. And you can take a look at that too and, and see where you need to go scout. Sintera is a uh, producer of different sensors. You can get their single sensor mounted to just to a Mavic or a Phantom. You can get the, the double 4K, which has its, uh, you can get it in RGB and near infrared or near infrared and red edge. So it's a true multi-spectral camera. You can get the, and you can kind of see the pricing there. None of it's real cheap, but if you, if you fly a lot of acres and you know you can do some different sensing, you can really start to see the value in, in, in your purchasing options. And I think in favor of time, we'll just we're going to skip past some of this. We did an AMS. We we've been doing AMS trials across the state. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who don't know, that's ammonia sulfate. Uh, there's been a bigger push here in the last few years to start adding sulfur to um, to soybeans and to your to your uh, uh, corn. You can see back in 2001, before the Clean Air Act really got going, uh, how much sulfur pollution was across this area versus 2015, to where people started cleaning all that up. So. Different areas, this is a, a field up in northern Indiana that, that uh, was on a center pivot. You can kind of see the two, uh, stri two strips right through the middle of the field that are circled where they put sulfur in. 
Uh, normally, it gives it a little deeper green, kind of lets the nitrogen get utilized more efficiently in the plant. Um, again, you can see the, the two dark strips with the light strip in the middle uh, that, that are circled. The strip in the middle had, didn't have anything applied to it, um, more as the other two did. This is from uh, Tipton County. We, had the, we compared no AMS versus AMS applied. Uh, at the time of testing, the pods were, were an inch long in the applied versus three quarter of an inch in the non applied. So this is a field, this is that same field from the air. Uh, we just had some different issues, and most of the green, the, the light green, is uh, they're more for, uh, or that, that's more uh, water damage than, than anything else. So I'm going to skip through this and that. We're using them for conservation structures. This is a grass waterway. Think about how handy it would be to be able to go out there and just by flying be able to see what the, the contour of that channel is. You can see here that, that it's not quite uniform, but he had, the, the guy had not mowed that recently. When they went back and mowed it, you can see you've got a nice channel there. So, you know, NRCS could use this to look at channel uh, depth and make sure that uh, different conservation structures are still within uh, specs for uh, their programs. Think about the severe weather we had last year. Shelby County got, uh, got quite a bit of hail last year, and it just pulverized this field uh, in, down, down there. And you can see in the bottom left and in the top right, that's where it didn't get hit near as bad as, where, uh, as it did right there through the middle of the field. So again, you can start to assess damage for like crop insurance. Um, we use them for uh, insurance, utilities, uh, business entities that you wouldn't think of, like infrastructure, doing uh, inspections on power lines, doing inspections on bridges or, or buildings where it would be more difficult for people or more dangerous for people to, to be involved with if they had to like rappel down with a rope or climb something. We can do volume calculations for gravel companies. Um, this, this image right here, the, the soil was impacted really heavily with a lot of compaction when they did, did some work to this uh, utility tower. And here's another, this is a better example this utility tower, uh, they ended up breaking a tile line when they were in the field, and it flooded out that much area. Now, if you're a if you're an insurance per if you're in crop insurance, then and you got to figure that out. It, it's a lot easier to fly it with a drone and find out that you got 4.79 acres total, as opposed to just going out there and trying to guess. So uh, we use them for aquaculture. We put tilapia in, in this pond and let them eat the algae all uh, year long. And you can see from July to October that they really clean that field up or that, uh, that pond up. This was in southern Indiana where, where ponds are really, or farm ponds are really important to livestock producers. So cleaner water means healthier animals. And then once the water got cold, you can have a fish fry. So what's next? What's the, where, where are we going with all this? How much money do you want to spend on your sensors? A thermal camera can run you anywhere upwards of $50,000. A good LiDAR camera can run you up to 150000 So, I mean, you can put a great big camera on a drone. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to give you uh, the results you want. You need to have a plan in mind for what you're going to do. So if you have questions on that, feel free to reach out to Purdue Extension. Um, we're, I really feel that we are leading the way in the Midwest as far as UAV technology. Um, I like this slide because uh, we kind of poke fun at, the, at, at any, any of the Indiana fans that are out there. So uh, I hope you don't take that personal, but uh, we just do it for fun. 
But the one thing that I want everybody to be able to bring home is that just because you're you've got a disability, it doesn't mean that you cannot you, you can't get out and do what you need to do. I that's a picture of me on the right. I'm sit, I'm sitting with the lieutenant governor. Uh, she's actually flying one of my drones, and we're you know I use them every day. I'm paralyzed from my waist down, and I use I use it on my farm. We farm my family farms 3,500 acres. We use them all the time for for crop scouting. We use them to to get out and work with people on the livestock side to check that fence, the check the livestock, check the forage, check the water. There's you can make quite a bit of money if you want to start a business. Um, well, I'll come back to that. Uh, business opportunities, crop scouting. You can charge anywhere from a dollar to five five dollars an acre. Insurance inspections. You can do upwards of twenty five dollars an hour. Photography, same. Infrastructure inspection. If you're good and you got the you, you get in with your local utility, you might be able to charge as much as two hundred and fifty dollars an acre or uh, per hour. Um, if you're into making movies, you can make you know fifty to seventy. If you're in the military, I've heard upwards of a hundred and ten thousand a year. So I mean, I'm not trying to give unreal re uh, expectation, but there is money that can be made with this. So the technology allows us again a manual flight allows that person to see their crops from a bird's eye view. You can find tile, erosion, water, uh, stand issues without getting out into the field and knocking everything down. You can do planned flights. You can use stitching software to make nice maps. Uh, we haven't even talked about uh, some of the technology that's coming out with the sprayer drones. Purdue has one of them. We're still learning how to use it. We're still trying to figure out licensing to get to where we can do aerial application with uh, with pesticides uh, for different applications. Like if there's a wet hole in the back of the field on a year like this, where we got it planted late, and there's weeds coming on, and you don't you don't want all that water ham, so you can go back there and spray. You could. Uh, you can get them with a, a fertilizer bin rather than the spray, uh, the spray tank, and you can go back and spread fertilizer with a cover crop and fill that water hole in with cover crop and choke the weeds out. So I mean, there's it, they're useful for orchards or vineyards or small plots. Just the, like I said, the sky's the limit, and we're still learning. I know that uh, Paul's going to shut me off here in just a minute or two. So, summing it up, drones have many applications. Uh, there's several that are available. There's different sensing of it, options that are available, and the technology brings faster value uh, to the producer. And there's so many options out there that really we're still just trying to figure it all out. So, my closing thoughts are. If you if you have an interest in this, number one, make sure that you check out uh, the licensing uh, process. Uh, we have designed uh, extension. We design, have designed a class. Uh, it's a it's a hands-on class, so it's not over technology like we are today. Um, that we we basically get you to the point where you're ready to sit down and take that test. Um, we also introduce different applications to the uh, that the drones can be used for and uh, but the, the number one thing there is make sure you get licensed the second thing that uh, you need to do is make sure that your drone fits your application there's no sense going out and spending twenty five thousand dollars for something that you can do with a with, with an eighteen hundred to two thousand dollar drone if you don't need true NDVI the best thing to look for is just that standard RGB camera. You can get a lot of information just by flying uh, a drone up in the air, taking a few pictures of your field, and just see what you got. Again, it gives you that bird's eye view. So, uh, and then the last thing that I'd like to touch on, make sure that you have insurance 
for your UAV because if that thing, heaven forbid, that thing falls out of the sky and hits somebody and kills them, the average lawsuit that is going to it's going to cost you about six point five million dollars. So make sure that you have enough liability insurance just in case something happens. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Paul, and I'll be happy to entertain any questions that uh, that you want to throw at me. Well, thanks so much, Mark, for that informative presentation. I know I learned a lot of things, um, just a lot of um, aspects to this um, area that uh, you may not think about right off the bat. And one thing I did want to mention that uh, Mark is also, has also been a member of our Indian Agribility Advisory uh, team for quite a few years, too, so we appreciate his input in that area. There is our first question for Mark. Okay, the FAA, the, the FAA licensing, we always get that kind of confused too, call it the FFA license. Um, it, the, the price of that is $150 to take the test. And that is every time you take it. So if you take it and you fail it, the first time it's gonna cost you $150 the second time. And that does not change from state to state. That is the federal test. So the when you get the license, uh, that is a federal license. It's good from if I if I live in Indiana and I go to Ohio or Kentucky or California or anywhere, that is that license is still good uh, for a drone. Okay, um, the drone that I'm using is the, the Phantom 4, and I picked my Phantom 4 up for $600 off of eBay, and it come with three batteries, a nice backpack, everything that I need to fly, uh, and that's going to be subjective to whatever you're gonna, whatever's going to work good for you. Uh, for my indoor presentations, I use what they call the Mavic Air. It's just a smaller version of the Mavic Pro, and that one was $1,000 when it first came out. I, you probably get one now for seven or $800. But whatever you're going to use is, uh, whatever you decide to use is probably going to cost something different. The And I know it's going to be hard to see. But this is my Phantom 4 that I fly, and it's just got a standard, it's just got the standard uh, standard camera on it right here, and that camera is just a, just a red, green, blue camera. I use um, a program called Drone Deploy, and it's a subscription for $1,000 a year. I can create that nice ortho mosaic, and I can create that nice uh, plant health map. And then it also gives different options, like if you want to create 3D images of, so if I want to do a 3D image of my of my house or one of my barns or my grain leg and bin set up, I can do that. So it all just depends on what your application is. And there's, and I'm not I'm not promoting drone deploy. I'm just saying that's what works good for me at this time. But I'm also using a fixed wing bird uh, that costs six thousand dollars. And if you want the if you want the software for that, it's proprietary and strictly for that bird. And the the cost for it is $150 a month plus like $30 or 30 cents an acre that you process. So the the pricing really varies between uh, between companies. Not having to be able to see the drone when you fly it. Well, that's. You pretty much well said it right there. Is you, if you're going to fly it, you have to be able to see it. I know that there's a lot of people that like to get the goggles and fly on uh, for what they call FPV, first person view, or where you'll fly off the iPad, you'll see whatever you see off the iPad. And 
I find myself doing that at times, but it, when I do that, I have a visual observer with me to make sure that the airspace is clear. Because if you're flying F, if you're flying on the goggles and that bird is two miles away, the tr uh, you're going to be seeing exactly what the camera sees, and you're not going to be able to see that airplane that's coming uh, into your airspace. You're not, you may not be able to see uh, everything that's around you. Now, even if you're pivoting and, sw and swiveling and, and looking up, looking down, you're still going to miss something. You might not see that eagle that's going to come in and take out, take out your drone. And it does happen. So you said it right there uh, in your question. You have to be able to see the drone when you fly it, just for safety purposes. I had a question that just came in through the chat. Oh, it disappeared. I'll have to get it. I, I can see it. I'll, I'll grab it here. Oh, okay. I'll answer the one you put up. You showed satellite images. How do you order satellite images for specific geographic areas? What are the approximate costs? Okay, that's going to depend on who you use. I'm, I, I, was, uh, I was using Climate Corporation's uh, field view. We, that's, the, that's what we use on our farm. So, again, I'm not promoting them. or promoting Encirca through Pioneer or anybody else. It, you're, it, that's something that really you have to, you'll have to do a little bit of research and see what works best for you. Field view, I think, is about a thousand dollars a year. Again, I don't know what I don't know what Encirca is, and that might be part of granular now. Um, I know there's some others out there that are available that give even better resolution than that than that 30 feet. Some of them are. Some of them are down to to about a couple of inches or sub inch, but I know that those are a little bit more money. Exactly what those are, I couldn't tell you. Okay, our question uh, in the chat that came up: How often do you have to renew your FAA license? Is the applicant also required to provide uh, TSA Transportation Safety Authority background check fees? No, um, you renew. You have to retest every two years. So I'm, I took my my test back in October of seventeen. So really, I need to start thinking about renewing my license uh, before the before October thirty first. So if I don't get it done by then, it will suspend that license. So every two years, and again, it's $150 to retake the test. Uh, no, you do not pay for a TSA background check. That's just something that they do. Once you take the test, you actually log in to the FAA website, uh, the website they give you, and you create a profile, and you apply to it through that. And then they'll do your background check. And it all takes about six weeks before you'll actually get your license assuming that you pass. So Mark, we're right at the end of our time. Did you want to uh, give a, a closer view of the drones you have? We, we talked about that. I can go ahead and yeah, yeah. Uh, X out of this, and I'll show a bigger picture of you there if you'd like to hold up your drones sure. there. A uh, little higher. There we go. Okay. That, that right there is what they call the uh, Tello. It, it, it's uh, about Two inches, it's not great big, but we use these in our program, our, our indoor programming and teaching people how to fly. You hook it up to your, your smartphone. And the reason we use these, it looks like something you'd get at Walmart, but this has actually got the technology in it that uh, it'll, if, when you turn it on, it'll sit there and hover. It'll take off and it'll hover and just sit there. It won't like crash into the wall just randomly. and and it takes, uh, it's got a camera on it. It's it's not a mo it's not on a gimbal, but it's still a, a 4K camera, and I think it's like eight megapixel. So it's still a pretty good camera. But that again, that's the Tello T E L L O, uh, hundred and fifty about a hundred hundred and fifty bucks. But it's a good entry level if you just you know something for the kids. Uh, this is the Mavic Air that I was talking about. 
Uh, it is on a gimbal. The, the camera is on a gimbal. I don't know if you can see it moving or not, but what makes this thing nice, it's small. It's about 10 inches, eight, well, not even 10 inches. And you can see my hand versus the, the, the size of that thing. Um, but it's nice because it's got obstacle avoidance on the front. You can see that here and on the back here uh, and then on the bottom. That's what all the, all the different little eyes are. And again, 4K camera. I think it's a 12 megapixel camera. So it takes really nice pictures and video. But I use that on my indoor programs mainly. Uh, kids love it because I can fly it with just hand movements and showing, you know, just some of the different fun things you can do with it. And then I also, I've also uh, showed the, the M4. This is not the Pro, but it still has, uh, right here you can see it's got the little eyes on it. It's got the eyes on the bottom. Uh, but that is the obstacle avoidance. This, this guy right here has flown several thousand acres. And I've had no trouble with it at all. So that you don't have to spend a lot of money to get involved with this, uh, but it does take a little bit of time to get get through the test and get that license and kind of figure out what you need. And if if you have any questions, uh, feel free that you can always send me an email. Uh, I don't. Paul, is it okay if I if I share my email with them? Oh, sure, definitely. Uh, if, if you want to, you can reach out to me at, uh, at C-A-R-T-E-264 at purdue.edu. Uh, I don't know if you want to put that up on the screen. Just stuck it in the chat. Uh, T-E. Nope. Okay, sorry. Should be C-A-R-T-E-264 at purdue.edu. And feel okay, free to shoot me an that. email. Uh, I'll be more than happy to talk with you uh, or answer any questions that you might have. There you go. Okay. Well, thanks again, Mark. Appreciate all that great information. We're going to archive this on our website. And thank you to everybody that joined us today. We will be uh, looking forward to hopefully seeing you on our next webinar in a couple months. Have a great day.